The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Give us grace, O Lord, to answer readily the call of our Savior, Jesus Christ, and to proclaim to all people the good news of his salvation, that we and the whole world may perceive the glory of his marvelous works, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. The Lord's word came to Jonah a second time. Get up and go to Nineveh, that great city, and declare against it the proclamation that I am commanding you. And Jonah got up and went to Nineveh according to the Lord's word. Now Nineveh was indeed an enormous city, a three days walk across. Jonah started into the city walking one day and he cried out, just 40, day, 40 days more and Nineveh will be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They proclaimed a fast and put on mourning clothes from the greatest of them to the least significant. God saw what they were doing, that they had ceased their evil behavior. So God stopped planning to destroy them and he didn't do it. Hear what the spirit is saying to God's people. This is what I'm saying, brothers and sisters. The time has drawn short. From now on, those who have wives should be like people who don't have them. Those who are sad should be like people who aren't crying. Those who are happy should be like people who aren't happy. Those who buy something should be like people who don't have possessions. Those who use the world should be like people who aren't preoccupied with it because this world in its present form is passing away. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. The Holy Gospel of our Savior Jesus Christ according to Mark. Glory to you, Lord Christ. After John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee, announcing God's good news, saying, now is the time. Here comes God's kingdom. Change your hearts and lives and trust this good news. As Jesus passed along the Galilee Sea, he saw two brothers, Simon and Andrew, throwing fishing nets into the sea, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, he said, and I'll show you how to fish for people. Right away they left their nets and followed him. After going a little farther, he saw James and John, Zebedee's son, in their boat repairing the fishing nets. At that very moment he called them. They followed him, leaving their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired workers. The Gospel of Christ. Praise to you, Lord Christ. I'd like to invite you to consider something. Think about a time when you had a sense of being called to something new. Maybe you started a new school. Maybe you left a job. 
Maybe you finished a degree program or moved to a new state or were called into a new romance or how to have a baby or to end a relationship. Maybe you were being led to a new faith community. Maybe you were being nudged to take a crazy risk. Or maybe God was calling you to stick with something that was difficult. What was that like? Did you fight it? Did you drop everything and give what a friend of mine calls two seconds notice where you throw all your papers up in the air and say, I quit? Was responding to that call harder than you thought it would be? Or was it easier than you thought it would be? In our readings today, we have two call stories that could not be more different. Jonah gets a call from God to go to Nineveh, the cap which was the capital of his mortal enemy, and to set them straight. And Jonah says, no, thank you. I'm going to run away instead. So he gets on a boat to Tarshish, which as far as we can tell doesn't actually exist. It's like saying they're going to the middle of nowhere or Timbuktu, which is understandable because if God said to me, Elizabeth, I want you to walk right into a terrorist headquarters and give them a piece of your mind, I would say, may I please have a map to Tarshish? Here's the thing, though. God goes back to Jonah a second time, even after he's run away and hidden from God and been swallowed by a fish. And this is good news because God does not work with the best of the best and the cream of the crop. God works with riffraff and ne'er-do-wells, those of us who are flaky and unreliable and nervous. God doesn't care if you're cowardly or indecisive. In fact, that's mostly who God works with, normal people, not exceptional ones. But back to Jonah, so God calls him, and part of the reason he resists this call is because he's built up this call as something huge and impossible to do. This city is so big, it takes three full days to walk across. In Jonah's mind, they're so hard-headed that he'll be in Nineveh for months, just banging his head against the wall. So then, it's supposed to be funny that he gets barely a day across the city, in Hebrew, he gets five words out of his mouth, and the people of Nineveh are like, okay, sounds good. I hear your message and I accept. They say, I'll give up all of our death-dealing ways and join your culture of God, your culture of love and life for everyone. And this has got to be whiplash for Jonah. But we all have those times, don't we, where we, we put off a task for six months and then it actually takes only like seven minutes to get it done. We think something's gonna be super hard and it just isn't that hard. That's in contrast to our disciples because Jesus comes for them and says, come and follow me. They don't buy a ticket to Tarshish. They say, that sounds good. In the blink of an eye, they make their decision. Notice though that Jesus doesn't say, here's my 12 step strategic plan. Would you like to follow me? He doesn't say, here's my manifesto. Can you sign on the dotted line? Instead, he just says, follow me. For the German theologian Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the most remarkable thing about Jesus' call is that it's void of all content. There's no program here, no platform, no set of opinions or list of rules. There's only a call to companionship, to closeness, to living together as we walk toward God's reign. The writers at the SALT Project point out that this minimalism may signal that while beliefs and behavior do play a role in discipleship, that's not really the heart of the matter. Rather, walking alongside Jesus is the heart of the matter, listening, reflecting, learning, and listening again. So when the call of God comes, what do we do? Do we buy a ticket to Tarshish? Do we drop our nets and follow Jesus? Or do we do something in between? Today is our annual meeting when the leaders of our community present, present a summary of our life and labor together over the past year. In my report, I could tell you about everything we've accomplished this year, the ways in which we're growing, 
both in attendance and spiritual maturity, how many signs of life there are in this place, the care that's been put into our building and our land, stewarding this little slice of creation that God has given us to tend. I could list all the projects we've done and the people we've helped and the organizations we've supported and the big and the small ways that we've ushered in this life-giving culture of God. And that is good and holy work, and it is to be celebrated. But there's something more important than all of those things. I believe that God is far more concerned with who we are and how we are listening for God's voice than what we accomplish. And let me be clear, God gives us a clear command to care for those around us, to be part of bringing in God's reign on earth and to be signs of love in a world that's bent towards death. What we do matters, but it stems from who we are and who God is and who we understand ourselves to be. As I look back over 2023, what strikes me as more important than what we've done as a community is who we are as a community. And this is what I mean. We are a listening community. Each week I ask, how is God present to you today? How is God directing your attention? Through this simple habit of asking the same question over time, week over week, it becomes a question that shapes us. Because we expect to notice the movement of the Spirit, we start to notice the movement of the Spirit. And we train our attention so that we can become ever more sensitive to the whispers of that still small voice in our midst. That has benefit in each one of our own lives, but it also has benefit for our community because with all of us listening, we each bring a sliver of clarity about the overall mission and ministry that God has in store for us. So this is a listening community. It's also a stable community. Here, the essentials matter and the non-essentials don't. That means we're not distracted by every trend or fad that comes our way. We know who we are and we know whose we are. We're grounded in the truth that when God gives us a call, we will hear it and we will have what we need to respond. Our stability also comes from your maturity. At the center of our life together is a core of healthy lay leaders who put the community first, who see themselves as humble servants, who aren't afraid of change, who communicate with care, and who deal well with the natural conflict that arises in any living community. More than any church I've been part of, you put the love of God in Christ first. The most important thing here is not your ego, not your own personal preferences, not the way we've always done it, not our own institutional survival. What is first here is simple, loving God and loving one another and listening to where and how God is calling. So this is a listening community. It's a stable community. And finally, it's a flexible community. You understand that a community too entrenched in its ways is a community headed towards ossification and death. Instead, you embrace the gentle sway of a dynamic life. You understand that the how of our life together will naturally shift over time, but the why remains the same. You are open. You have the humility to recognize that sometimes a new day calls for new ways. You realize that anything that is alive is changing and you work hard to be open-handed and to allow yourself to shift in response to a new reality. So we're listening, we're grounded and we're flexible. Thanks be to God. I wanna give you an example this year of when I was not those things and how at what I have learned in your midst helped me course correct. If you were here at the last annual meeting, you'll remember that I had this grand idea called the Ministry Action and Renewal Teams. 
There are going to be four teams, each simultaneously addressing different parts of our common life. There were each group was going to have six meetings a year, which if you're keeping track, that's 24 meetings a year. It's so way too elaborate for our time and place. And I realized this as I was putting together an elaborate color-coded schedule of this group can meet on third Sundays, but not on third Sundays because DOK is in this group. It was crazy, y'all. And I was like, what am I doing? This is way too complicated for who we are as a community. So I stopped, I listened, and I realized I was way more focused on accomplishing this goal of mine than on accomplishing God's goals. I took some time to pause and return to what mattered. And I remembered that my job is to stay grounded, to pay attention to the present moment, because that is exactly where God meets us. I returned to the idea that God would let us know what we needed to do when we needed to do it. And then I let go of my grand plans. I opened my clenched fist and let myself be okay with changing course and slowing down when it became clear that was the best course. This was all helped by knowing that this community is one of grace and mercy. It helped knowing that you were probably very amused by my way too complicated idea of running four complex processes in parallel when your spiritual gift is that you excel truly excel at doing the next right thing. It was also helped by a sermon that Sam preached where he shared with us the simple but profound idea that God moves at three miles an hour. If you'll remember, this idea was from theologian Kosuke Koyama, and it captured many of our hearts. He observed that Jesus is the best idea we have of what God is like. And Jesus walked roundabout at the same speed that we all do, about three miles an hour. At three miles an hour, you can stop and pick up someone who has fallen. At three miles an hour, you can look around and see who's not being included. At three miles an hour, you can talk with the person next to you and learn their name and their struggles and their dreams. At three miles an hour, you can marvel at the beauty of the world and not worry that you're going to trip and fall on your face. At three miles an hour, it's very easy to see the signs pointing the direction to go. As we walk into the next year together, I hope we continue walking at the speed of love. I hope we continue listening for God's call so that when God shows up, and says, follow me, walk beside me, I have a job for you. We're ready to respond. Beloved, you are friends of God. You are a companion of Jesus the Christ. He invites you to be close with him. He invites you to fall in step with him, to walk as he walks and see what he sees. He invites you to live well together as the body of Christ as we walk together toward God's reign. He invites you to listen, to ground yourself in his love, and to be open to the movement of the Spirit.